listening squirrels. I put my hair up, took my earrings off. I was getting ready to put my jammies on. Or my gown. It's cold. I mean, it's getting rather warm. So, And then I remembered I hadn't read. Can't even remember if I read yesterday. I guess I just have to go back and look. I'm going back, I think, and reading the last page or so of what I read before. And I think this is the last chapter, y'all. And I can't find any more Tommy and Tuppence books that I can get to. If I feel well enough, I may go by the library tomorrow or see if I can... I know there's a that Libby thing that... Or there's something else that hooks up with your library. I don't know if I can get anything on that or not. Or I may just go get the old-fashioned book. Or, if I don't feel like going out, we'll just get the next Miss Marple book, which is the only other Miss Marple book we can read. The Moving Finger, I think it is. We'll see. I wonder now, is that Mrs. Van Snyder an accomplice, or is she... He left the sentence unfinished. Hear any noise from inside? He asked abruptly. Not a thing, but the door fits well. One couldn't hope to hear much. Mr. Carter made up his mind suddenly. I don't like this business. We're going in. Got the master key? Of course, sir. Call up Evans and Clydesley. Reinforced by the other two men, they advanced towards the door of the suite. It opened noiselessly when the first man inserted his key. They found themselves in a small hall. To the right was the open door of a bathroom, and in front of them was the sitting room. On the left was a closed door, and from behind it, a faint sound, rather like an asthmatic pug, could be could be heard. Mr. Carter pushed the door open and entered. The room was a bedroom with a big double bed, ornately covered with a spread of rose and gold. On it, bound hand and foot with her mouth secured by a gag and her eyes almost starting out of her head with pain and rage, was a middle-aged, fashionably dressed woman. On a brief order from Mr. Carter, the other men had covered the whole suite, one remaining outside in the passage on guard. Only Tommy and his chief had entered the bedroom. As he leaned over the bed and strove to unfasten the knots, Carter's eyes went roving around the room in perplexity. Save for an immense quantity of truly American luggage, the room was empty. There was no sign of the Russian or of tuppence. In another minute, the waiter came hurrying in and reported that the other rooms were also empty. Tommy went to the window only to draw back and shake his head. There was no balcony, nothing but a sheer drop to the street below. Certain it was this room they entered? asked Carter peremp peremptorily. Sure, besides, the man indicated the woman on the bed. With the aid of a penknife, Carter parted the scarf that was half choking her, and it was at once clear that, whatever her sufferings, they had not deprived Mrs. Cortland Van Snyder of the use of her tongue. When she had exhausted her first indignation, Mr. Carter spoke mildly. Would you mind telling me exactly what happened from the beginning? I guess I'll sue the hotel for this. It's a perfect outrage. I was just looking for my bottle of killagripe when a man sprang on me from behind and broke a little glass bottle right under my nose, and before I could get my breath, I was all in. When I came to, I was lying here, trussed up, and goodness knows what's happened to my jewels. He's gotten the lot, I guess. Your jewels are quite safe, I fancy, said Mr. Carter dryly. He wheeled round and picked up something from the floor. You were standing just where I am when he sprang upon you? That's so, assented Mrs. Van Snyder. It was a fragment of thin glass that Mr. Carter had picked up. He sniffed it and handed it to Tommy. Ethyl chloride, he murmured. 
instant anesthes anesthetic, but it only keeps one under for a moment or so. Surely he must still have been in the room when you came to, Mrs. Van Snyder. Isn't that just what I'm telling you? Oh, it drove me half crazy to see him getting away and me not able to move or do anything at all. Getting away, said Mr. Carter sharply. Which way? Through that door, she pointed to one and to one in the opposite wall. He had a girl with him, but she seemed kind of limp, as though she'd had the had had a dose of the same dope. Carter looked a question at his henchman. Leads into the next suite, sir, but double doors supposed to be bolted each side. Mr. Carter examined the door carefully, then he straightened himself up and turned towards the bed. Mrs. Van Snyder, he said quietly, do you still persist in your assertion that the man went out this way? Why, certainly he did. Why shouldn't he? Because the door happens to be bolted on this side, said Mr. Carter dryly. He rattled the handle as he spoke. A look of the utmost astonishment spread over Mrs. Van Snyder's face. Unless someone bolted the door behind him, said Mr. Carter, he cannot have gone out that way. He turned to Evans, who had just entered the room. Sure they're not anywhere in this suite? Any other communicating doors? No, sir, and I'm quite sure. Carter turned his gaze this way and that about the room. He opened the big hanging wardrobe, looked under the bed, up the chimney, behind all the curtains. Finally, struck by a sudden idea and disregarding Mrs. Van Snyder's shrill protest, he opened the large wardrobe trunk and rummaged swiftly in the interior. Suddenly, Tommy, who had been examining the communicating door, gave an exclamation. Come here, sir, look at this. They did go this way. The bolt had been very cleverly filed through, so close to the socket that the join was hardly perceptible. The door won't open because it's locked on the other side, explained Tommy. In another minute, they were out in the corridor again, and the waiter was opening the door of the adjoining suite with his pass key. This suite was untenanted. Then, when they came to the communicating door, they saw that the same plan had been adopted. The bolt had been filed through and the door was locked. The key having been removed, but nowhere in the suite was there any sign of tuppence or the fair bearded Russian, and there was no other communicating door, only the one on the corridor. But I'd have seen them come out, protested the waiter. I couldn't have helped seeing them. I can take my oath. They never did. Damn it all, cried Tommy. They can't have vanished into thin air. Carter was calm again now, his keen brain working. Telephone down and find who had this suite last and when. Evans, who had come with them, leaving Clydesley on guard in the other suite, obeyed. Presently, he raised his head from the telephone. An invalid French lad, M. Paul de Varez, he had a hospital nurse with him. They left this morning. An exclamation burst from the other secret serviceman, service man, the waiter. He had gone deathly pale. The invalid boy, the hospital nurse, he stammered. I, they passed me in the passage just now. I never dreamed I'd seen them so often before. Are you sure they were the same, cried Mr. Carter. Are you sure, man, you looked at them well? The man shook his head. I hardly glanced at them. I was waiting, you understand, on the alert for the others, the man with the fair beard and the girl. Of course, said Mr. Carter with a groan. They counted on that. With a sudden exclamation, Tommy stooped down and pulled something out from under the sofa. It was a small rolled-up bundle of black. Tommy unrolled it, and several articles fell out. The outside wrapper was the long black coat Tuppets had worn that day inside that day. Inside was her walking dress, her hat, and a long fair beard. It's clear enough now, he said bitterly. 
They've got her up, got tuppence. That Russian devil has given us the slip. The hospital nurse and the boy were accomplices. They stayed here for a day or two to get the hotel people accustomed to their presence. The man must have realized at lunch that he was trapped and proceeded to carry out his plan. Probably he counted on the room next door being empty. It may have been when he fixed the bolts. However, the man agreed to the man aged to silence both aged no however he managed this is man space aged managed to silence both the women next door woman woman next door and tuppence brought her in here dressed her in boys clothes altered his own appearance and walked out as bold as brass the clothes must have been hidden ready but I don't see how he managed Tuppence's acquiescence. I can see, said Mr. Carter. He picked up a shining piece of steel from the carpet. That's a fragment of a hypodermic needle she was doped. My God, groaned Tommy, and he's got clear away. We don't know that, said Carter quickly. Remember, every exit is watched for a man and a girl. Not for a hospital nurse and an invalid boy. They'll have left the hotel by now. Such on inquiry proved to be the case. The nurse and her patient had driven away in a taxi some five minutes earlier. Look here, Beersford, said Mr. Carter. For God's sake, pull yourself together. You know that I won't leave a stone unturned to find that girl. I'm going back to my office at once, and in less than five minutes, every resource of the department will be at work. We'll get them yet. Will you, sir? He's a clever devil, that Russian. Look at the cunning of, of this coop of his. But I know you'll do your best. Only pray God it's not too late. They've got it in for us badly. And maybe it was coup and not. He left the Blitz Hotel and walked blindly along the street, hardly knowing where he was going. He felt completely paralyzed. Where to search? What to do? He went into the green park and dropped down upon a seat. He hardly noticed when someone else sat down at the opposite end and was quite startled to hear a well-known voice. If you please, sir, if I might make so bold, Tommy looked up. Hello, Albert, he said dully. I know all about it, sir, but don't take on so. Don't take on. He gave a short laugh. Easily said, isn't it? Ah, but think, Sir Blunt's brilliant detectives never beaten, and if you'll excuse my saying so, I happen to overhear what you and the missus were ragging about this morning. Mr. Poirot and his... I flipped up how to say that. And his little gray cells. Well, sir, why not use your little gray cells and see what you can do? It's easier to use your little gray cells in fiction than it is in fact, my boy. Well, said Albert stoutly, I don't believe anybody could put the missus out for good and all. You know what she is, sir. Just like one of those rubber bones you buy for little do dorgs. Guaranteed indestructible. Albert, said Tommy, you cheer me. Then what about using your little gray cells, sir? You're a persistent lad, Albert. Playing the fool has served us pretty well up to now. We'll try it again. Let us arrange our facts neatly and with the method. At ten minutes past two exactly, our quarry enters the lift. Five minutes later, we speak to the lift man. And having heard what he says, we go up to the third floor at, say, 19 minutes past two. We enter the suite of Mrs. Van Snyder, and now what significant fact strikes us? There was a pause. There wasn't such a thing as a trunk in the room, was there? Asked Albert, his eyes lighting suddenly. Mana me, said Tommy, you do not understand the psychology of an American woman who has just returned from Paris. There were, I should say, about 19 trunks in the room. 
What I mean to say, a trunk's a handy thing if you've got a dead body about you want to get rid of, not that she's dead for a minute. We searched the only two that were big enough to contain a body. What's the next fact in chronological order? You've missed one out when the missus and the bloke dressed up as a hospital nurse. The bloke dressed up as a hospital nurse passed the waiter in the passage. It must have been just before we came up in the lift. They must have had a narrow escape of meeting us face to face. Pretty quick work that I... He stopped. What is it, sir? Be silent, mon ami. I have the kind of little idea. Colossal stupendous. It always comes sooner or later to... How do you say his name? Air... Air... I remember the first part was air. Air cool? Poirot. But if so, if that's it, oh, Lord, I hope I'm in time. He raced out of the park, Albert hard on his heels, inquiring breathlessly as he ran, What's up, sir? I don't understand. That's all right, said Tommy. You're not supposed to. Hastings never did. If your gray cells weren't of a very inferior order to mine, what fun do you think I should get out of this game? I'm talking damned, I'm talking damned rot, but I can't help it. You're a good lad, Albert. You know what Tuppence is worth. She's worth a dozen of you and me. Thus talking breathlessly as he ran, Tommy re-entered the portals of the Blitz. He caught sight of Evans and drew him aside with a few hurried words. The two men entered the lift, Albert with them. Third floor, said Tommy. At the door of number 318, they paused. Evans had a pass key and used it forthwith. Without a word of warning, they walked straight into Mrs. Van Snyder's bedroom. The lady was still lying on the bed, but was now arrayed in a becoming negligee. She stared at them in surprise. Pardon my failure to knock, said Tommy pleasantly, but I want my wife. Do you mind getting off that bed? I guess you've gone clean plum crazy, cried Mrs. Van Snyder. Tommy surveyed her thoughtfully, his head on one side. Very artistic, he pronounced, but it won't do. We looked under the bed, but not in it. I remember using that hiding place myself when young, horizontally across the bed underneath the bolster and that nice wardrobe trunk all ready to take away the body in later. But we were a bit too quick for you just now. You'd have time to dope tuppence. Put her under the bolster and be gagged and bound by your accomplices next door. And I'll admit we swallowed your story all right for the moment, but when one came to think it out, with order and method, impossible to drug a girl, dress her in boys' clothes, gag and bind another woman, and change one's own appearance all in five minutes. It says live minute. Maybe it is live minutes. Whatever. Simply a physical impossibility. The hospital nurse and the boy were to be a decoy. We were to follow that trail, and Mrs. Van Snyder was to be a pitied victim. Just help the lady off the bed, will you, Evans? You have your automatic? Good. Protesting shrilly, Mrs. Van Snyder was hauled from her place of repose. Tommy tore off the coverings and the bolster there lying horizontally. At the top of the bed was Tuppence. Her eyes closed and her face waxed, and for a moment Tommy felt a sudden dread. Then he saw the slight rise and fall of her breast. She was drugged, not dead. He turned to Albert and Evans, and now, Messieurs, he said dramatically, the final coup. Coup. With a swift, unexpected gesture, he seized Mrs. Van Snyder by her elaborately dressed hair. It came off in his hand. As I thought, said Tommy, number 16. It was about half an hour later when Tuppence opened her eyes and found a doctor and Tommy bending over her. Number 16, queried Tuppence feebly. Crushed like an eggshell, said Tommy. Metaphorically, I mean, Carter's got him. The doctor then had his innings. Presently, he departed with the assurance that I was now well. Now tell me about 
Tell me all about it, said Tuppence eagerly. Tommy gave her a spirited narrative. Weren't you half frantic about me? asked Tuppence faintly. Not particularly. One must keep calm, you know. Liar, said Tuppence. You look quite haggard still. Well, perhaps I was just a little worried, darling. Anyway, it's all over. We've caught a master criminal by the aid of the little gray cells. That reminds me. I intend to raise Albert's wages and now can retire into private life and grow vegetable marrows. Not vegetable marrows, said Tuppence decidedly. Chickens? You're nearer, but still not there. Tommy stared at her. Use your little gray cells. I'll give you a hint. The best wives whisper it. She's got a little bird on that bed. Tuppence, cried Tommy. Tuppence held him off for one minute, smiling up at him. You're rather a darling, Tommy, she said softly. And you know, you said the other day our talents do lie in the direction of, of a drama of strong domestic interest. The end. There's gonna be a baby. And I thought there were more, but I guess that was the series all in one book. So, like I said, I'll look around and see, uh, ooh, wait a minute. This is publicity, a Tommy and Tuppence mystery, but is that, let's see if it's in public domain. See in store, okay, okay. Publicity. Let's see, when was it? Publication date. But that's not when it was written. Was it written? Oh, this review says it's a weak story. But that's only one. Thirty-six percent gave it five stars, nineteen four stars, three stars, thirty-two percent, and so on and so forth. I want to find out when it was written. Oh, well, I won't hold y'all up. We'll read something tomorrow. If I can find another one that's Tommy and Tuppets, it's okay to read, I'll do that. If not, it will probably be the moving finger. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Have good sleep. Bye-bye.